Hi, and welcome to Facts and Blog and Podcast. You know where we are. And Bobby thanks you because I woke up this morning yeah. and did my hair and put on makeup <laughs> because the normal the yeah. normal realm is a ponytail uh-huh. and a fresh face. Yeah, my yeah. See, I we should probably have a little powder room in the new place just because uh, I feel like I get a little shiny on camera while I'm up here. I <laughs> get a little a little blotchy. Hi and welcome. Hi and welcome to the Facts and Blog and Podcast. If you're looking to up your game for gun cleaning and maintenance, you have to check out the Tipton Ultra Gun Vice. Uh, This thing is amazing. It's incredibly modular, uh, pretty lightweight, but really, really heavy duty, all the way down to the steel tube frame, all these different modular pieces and parts, even the accessory trays are solvent resistant, and uh, they have excellent gripping pads to make sure that you don't scrape up the gun that you're working on. Even work on things like crossbows, so if you want some Something that's going to be the one-stop vice for all of your gun cleaning and maintenance needs. You definitely need to check them out. Uh, you could head to tiptonclean.com to check out all the specs, all the reviews, see some more photos uh, of this vice in action. We're actually going to be using this particular one for some research and development projects uh, for some new products from Faxon coming up soon, and we're excited to share both those products and the footage of the testing with you. Uh, so again. Visit tiptonclean.com and check out the Ultra Gun Vice. Hi, and welcome to episode 28 of the Facts and Blog and Podcast. We have an excellent show lined up for you today. Sean Maloney from Second Call Defense is here to talk to us a little bit about the legal side of being a gun owner and what happens if you ever have to use your firearm in self-defense, whether it's your concealed carry weapon, whether it's your bedside gun, is it castle doctrine? all of those things explained. Sean is going to go over it, and he has a special deal for all of the Facts and Podcast audience that we'll give at the end of his segment. But before we go any further, Britt Faxon is here to go over her take on our new move and facility for segment four of the Faxon Move updates. She's going to be talking to us a little bit more of what it's going to be like on the HR side of things and also share a little bit of background about uh, the hopes and dreams of our founders, Bob and Barry Faxon. We're very excited to have her. So without any further ado, let's get on with episode 28. Well, as promised, Britt Faxon is joining us today to give us segment four of the facts and move updates don't forget you can find those at the top of all of our podcast episodes as well as the move playlist on youtube so Britt, thank you so much for joining us justin thanks for having me excellent so real quick i mean you, you kind of put on your official title like corporate secretary but like you you do a lot of things just like anybody in a up-and-coming business has to do to wear a lot of hats but you know uh, you you kind of have more of a you know, you have an HR role, you have a financial role, um, obviously some some secretarial type things. But w- what is your typical day like here for, for folks that are just meeting you? My typical day prior to the move was really spent, really focused on AP, HR, focused on um, making sure that everybody was, you know, all their files are in line and just really a lot of daily tasks, a lot of admin tasks. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, the fun thing or one of the fun things, you know, about, uh, being here for you, I'm sure maybe, maybe sometimes it's taxing, but I mean, your, your family's here, you know, this is, you know, been a, been a family business. This was a family dream. And you've told me before about how, you know, when firearms first started, this was, you know, a big dream of Bob's. Yes, Um, it was. And (laughs) obviously as his wife, you, you probably heard the ups and downs and all the dream catching and all the the stuff that was going on there. But if you just Mm -hmm. rewind back to the beginning stages of when, when Bob and Barry were really getting serious about bringing something like the ARAC to the market, Mm -hmm. kind of, what was that like? What was the launching of, of this brand like? If I could, I'd just like to hop back a couple years back past that and just talk about Bobby heading out to SHOT Show a couple of times and calling throughout the day and just talking about what he was seeing and um, where he thought we could play into it. And um, it's kind of a visionary. And so he kind of left thinking, oh, man, it's it's a tough market. Yeah. And, you know, and then... Um, one night sitting at the kitchen table after having watched some 
enjoying some history channel. <laughs> as you do, mm. as you do. And, um, just wanting to seeing that the, um, AK 47 was really occasionally ranking higher on these shows than the M 16. Mm -hmm. Forgive me. Not the ultimate gun person here. Uh, going to try to hang. I'm going to try to hang <laughs> with you gun people. <laughs> um, and just, you know, just coming up, just dreaming up that A-Rack. And it was at the kitchen table with the boys sitting around and um, took it to a friend of his that was just an amazingly talented man, um, John Illum. John's no longer with us. We all talk about him a lot. I know mm -hmm. you've heard stories about him. Yeah, for sure. Quite a character. Mm -hmm. A lot of fun to have here. And really it was them going off site in the evening and working on these things. John working through the day. You know, them doing their day job and then getting and getting out there in the evening and spending time and getting it to market. And um, so a lot of fun, a lot of energy, but yeah. fun. Yeah. And what I mean, a privilege to get to do something like that. And like we've said on the show before, because I think sometimes, you know, people forget. And, you know, I mentioned this when uh, Joey and, and Ryan were on to do these segments. You know, Facts and Machining itself has been around since the late 70s. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Bob and Barry were still doing that, you know, while yes, this was were. getting to launch. So it's not like one shut down or they both came at the same time. Uh, but, you know, Firearm starts in 2012 and only really becomes its own, you know, official separate company uh, from machining a few years ago. So, I mean, it, it's a in full disclosure, of to, in 2012, we were a separate company. Mm. Um, it was just that we were behaving more like more like just our e-commerce website. Sure. And then um, and then a few years later, more of a transition to the point where we produce we purchased plucked out a portion of them and then are producing our own stuff. Yeah. And then, of course, reaching this point of what we're you know here to really talk about. Right. Which is the, the big deal. I mean, it's it's not just that we are growing, but also facts and machining is growing and they need the space that we take up. And we've shown drone shots of this building before. It's kind of like a big horseshoe. And, mm -hmm. you know, for the most part, machining's on one side, firearms is on the other side. But when you guys first started, it was a lot more shared space, you know, for mm -hmm. sure. And our shipping area was basically the office for everyone and firearms it was. right now we all we all sat shoulder to shoulder yeah. i mean i'm looking uh i'm looking at a person that i sat shoulder to shoulder with for a very long time yeah and if the other person was here we'd be looking at him too <laughs> yeah and there were three of us tucked in a corner yeah that's right once upon a time our coo took customer service calls so I think um, that's once it. upon a time our coo and i were on the shipping desk together <laughs> and i i will tell you i looked over at him and said you know what I hope? I hope today is the last day that I ever see you on the shipping table. Yeah. And I think it really may have been. Right. Right. I mean, and, and again, it's just talking about something that goes from a dream to be being able to grow like it has and and what it's going to do in the future. So let's go ahead and talk about the new facility. Um, obviously, picking out a facility is kind of a taxing job, you know, finding the right place, not wanting to, um, you know, dislocate your, your workforce you and cannot, everything. You cannot, because they are the most important thing here. Yeah. And Joey and, and Ryan, you know, both spoke of that too. So we, we know that everybody in this decision-making process had, had that in mind. So it's been really great that we're still very close, you know, uh, to this current facility, only about 10 ish minutes up the road to mm -hmm. get to Westchester. Um, but from that HR perspective and kind of from the beginning days of the dreams of facts and firearms, you know, how do you feel this new facility is kind of the next step? You know, how, how do you feel that this is the, you know, kind of the, a new beginning, a, a, a nice refresh for the brand? Yeah. So, I mean, first, I mean, what I would tell you is that, I mean, we're leaving a spectacular facility. And so it's, it's not like it's been hard to be here. Sure. It's been wonderful. And in some ways we've, um, been able to get a lot of, you know, some support right. and it's been great. And we've been, it's been a really nice relationship. We can help machining. They can help us. Um, but I just think, and I know that even a lot of the guys who are on a lot of the, um, they're friends, you know, right. machining people, 
maybe they had some time on the firearm side and firearms guy the same and and they're friends and we see them sitting together at lunch and so I'm sure that they're, they're kind of, you know, I'm sure there are some people who are really going to miss their people. Sure. Because it's a it's it's a very close group. Mm -hmm. um, but I think getting into that new facility and just, you know, everybody's working really hard and just to say, you know, we're in our own place. Right. That says a lot. And again, being here has been wonderful. It's a beautiful place to be. But our place is going to be fantastic also. And it's going to be ours. Yeah. And I think. The things that Bob and Barry have been doing to kind of spec out the building. And obviously, you know, they've they've worked with each of us and worked with Joey a lot uh, to make sure we have what we need. But it's it's even though it's an existing building that we're adding on to. I mean, it might as well for all intents and purposes, might as well have been a brand new building because of it, all the stuff that yes. was taken down and, and built up. And it's like it's more purpose built to what we're doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I was over there yesterday. I go over not as often as most people go over just because I cannot be really helpful in that, you know, there's a lot of hard work going on, a lot of hard physical work going on. Um, but I did go over yesterday and they've been grinding the floors. The floors were really laden with, with some stamping oil and they were they were pretty dark. Yeah. And, you know, it's just so important that places be light and that, you know, you have that great light. And it was incredible because even this very distinct smell mm -hmm. that that building had, that's gone. And yeah. it smells so fresh. Yeah. You know, so the whole it is incredible. I mean, it's just basically been taken down to the, to the bare bones. Yeah. And it's fresh and it's bright. It is very exciting. Yeah. I mean, and it's, you know, it's it's the shop area. It's the finished goods area. It's the office areas. And like we've said before, this isn't like, you know, just picking up your stuff and dropping it in a new space and just running however it is. This has been, okay, we need the addition here. This needs to be clean like this. Walls need to be here. We need a conference room there. It needs this infrastructure. I mean, there's so mm -hmm. many moving parts that go along with it getting all the, you know, the labor to help with it. And, you know, now, and what we showed some footage of for the first time last week was footage of machines and things actually coming into the facility, which I think makes it all of a sudden way more real, mm -hmm. uh, you know, starting to see that stuff. And again, like you said about machining helping out, you know, it's, it's, it's machining's uh, tractor trailer that brought it in. You know, right. so something about seeing the, you know, the facts of machining semi truck back into the loading dock. Has so everybody everybody could do seen it. a picture of the facts of machining semi? Yes, they have. With, that, with the flag. With and that all extremely patriotic <laughs> it's, it's <a> graphic <laughs> on there. Yes. yes, they have now all for sure seen it. And <laughs> okay, we'll show good. it again. Why not? We'll all right. and show it Fantastic. again. But, uh, you know, I, I am. I'm excited about that. And also, you know, the fact that this also means we're a little more able to expand the team, too. So, you know, we've been putting out that we are hiring and, and such. And so if you have applied uh, for the different positions um, here, uh, chances are Britt is one of the people that's uh, reviewing your application. And, and making sure that those get to the right place. And at the end of today's episode, we'll run that promo video again so you can find all the different postings uh, for the open positions here at Facts and Firearms. Dustin, thank you for that. That's that's so helpful. Oh, good. You yeah. Know, to getting that out and letting people know that that our team is constantly growing. Yeah. And and always be looking, you know, if you have a skill set, always be looking because we're, we're going to start doing some different things. Right. And they are very exciting. Yeah. And um, it's going to not just be that the skill set that you see of us now. That's really going to be changing, I think. Yeah. And I mean, just, you know, think back for a minute, you know, eight years ago, uh, it was just, you know, the beginnings of the ARAC 21. All right. You want me to give you a little history it's, lesson? It, yeah. It's something that I keep in my mind. Yeah. Um, so I worked until I had some until Bobby and I had our first child and then I stopped working and then we went, so we went on to have two more and stayed home and, um, your last kid's a little independent and you feel like you can kind of break out a little faster. And, and, um, so I prayed for a job and, yeah. and I got, and, and God gave me this job and I will never forget at the time I was helping my sister with her baby and I was standing with her baby on my hip and standing in my kitchen and typing with one hand and yeah. 
um, Bobby would call and say, hey, we need this. Or um, at the time, our director of sales would call, hey, we need this. And I would just fill in with those small tasks. And then as my family grew, I was able to let my job grow. Right. And it's been it's it's a lot of fun. And what I can tell you is the team here is spectacular. It gives me chills to talk about it because yeah. it's a team of people who really care about one another. Yeah. And it, and I know that family is family, mm -hmm. but we are a work family and we, you know, I love that, that we have an environment where we can really speak openly sure. and tell each other what, you know, what, maybe what we need, ask for help. It is a great group of people. Yeah. And I think this, this whole new move and this, uh, everything, I think it's just going to enhance that more, I agree. you know, and uh, agree. so it is, you know, if you are interested, especially if you're in the tri-state area, Southwest Ohio, you're, you're looking for uh, a new career. We know a lot of people have um, uh, been hit hard by the pandemic. A yes. lot of folks in the manufacturing uh, been realm. So fortunate yeah. That's, that. that's been an amazing thing that since, you know, we were considered an essential business uh we've been able to carry on and and grow through this um so, yeah it's been fantastic mm -hmm. well Britt, thank you so much for joining us this week dustin this was fun if you need me to come back I will. <laughs> yeah, you, you know where we are and bobby thanks you because i woke up this morning yeah and did my hair and put on makeup because <laughs> the normal the yeah. normal realm is a ponytail uh -huh. and a fresh face. Yeah, my yeah. See, I we should probably have a little powder room in the new place just because uh, I feel like I get a little shiny on camera while I'm up here. <laughs> I get a little a little blotchy. No, uh, but seriously, thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, don't forget you could check out all of these segments on our YouTube channel uh, at the Facts and Move playlist. And they're also going to be at the top of each one of our episodes uh, as we continue on into the move. We're going to have some more names and faces on uh, and we're going to wrap up the series with Bob and Barry uh, once the facility is complete and we're all moved in. So I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Thanks again. Thank you. I think their product headline says it best, ring steel, not your ears. If you haven't checked out uh, episode 27 of the Facts and Blog and Podcast, we actually spoke uh, to Jared from Caldwell Shooting about some of their uh, extensive line of hearing protection and accessories. One of the things that they sent out to us was a set of their Emax Shadows. And the nice thing about the Emax Shadows is not only are they excellent ear protection for the range, for training or even when you're just mowing your lawn or working with power tools uh, but they also are a bluetooth headset so if you're into earbuds and power beats and airpods and all that kind of thing you can still get great stereo sound dual microphones and device control all right here from the shadows and again when you use those foam tips uh, you also get a 25 db noise reduction rating as well so if you're out on the range all day, you're working on a project in the garage, you want to listen to music, you still need to take calls, that sort of thing, no need to be taken on and off the giant muffs. You could just have a pair of shadows in and you can find these over at caldwellshooting.com. And don't forget to check out our whole episode about hearing protection with Caldwell at faxandfirearms.com slash blog. For those of you who have been watching the podcast for a while, you may know that uh, we had Ryan Donahue from Crimson Trace on for one of our episodes to talk all things optics and red dots and some of the exciting things that CT has coming up. But I just wanted to share one of my personal favorite products of theirs, and that is their Railmaster Pro, the CMR204. So not only is it a tactical light, it's also a laser, and it has all of the industry proven technology that Crimson Trace has been known for for so many years. But they're not just limited to things like lights and lasers. They've made a big splash in the electro optics game, whether it's looking at something like a traditional rifle scope or maybe even their new battle optic, which you may or may not have seen in some TV shows and movies recently. They have a lot to offer. So obviously you're going to be seeing some more stuff uh, of Crimson Trace popping up with us here at Facts and Firearms. You may have even seen it uh, staged on our limited edition Mustang rifle 
vehicle that came out in the spring of 2020. Again, lots of cool stuff from them, just like the CMR204 or anything in their Railmaster series. We would encourage you to check them out at crimsontrace.com. Right, as promised, uh, this week we have a very special guest where we're kind of, uh, you know, we've been in and out of things like tutorials and how-tos and some product items, um, but we, we do like to talk about just, you know, the, the firearms community and some of the things that surround it, whether it be culture, what have you. And so it's great to have a legal mind on. Uh, Sean Maloney from Second Call Defense is here, and uh, he's going to walk us through some of what Second Call is all about, but also some of the laws and perceptions that go along with gun ownership, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, legal standards and so on. So, Sean, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate uh, uh, being here today. And of course, I've had a long-standing relationship with Facts and the Facts and Firearms make a yeah. great product. And uh, and I always like to pat you guys on the back for what you do because manufacturing firearms isn't the easiest thing to do in the world with all the regulations and and yeah. everybody knocking on your door. So yeah, for I, sure. I appreciate the opportunity. Oh, totally. Our pleasure. So, Sean, I mean, when we look at secondcalldefense.org um, and we click on the team, it says you're a defense attorney. That's correct. So how long have you been practicing and, and kind of, you know, uh, what other things do you do outside of even okay. second call? Uh, I started practicing uh, criminal law in 1993. Uh, it was, I, I sort of fell into it. Mm -hmm. I was in the house counsel for J2 Homes and then Dixon Builders. And every Monday morning, I ended up going to court somewhere to get my contractors out of jail from a weekend of drinking and fighting <laughs> or whatever they were doing. And yeah. so that's kind of how my criminal practice started. And then probably the last 15 years, uh, it's been almost exclusively confined to the area of, of a good guy or a good girl using a gun in self-defense or firearms law. Whether it's Nick's appeals, is someone getting turned down from, buy, from buying a firearm, uh, representing people against the ATF or the FBI for oftentimes crimes that they didn't know they were committing. And so yeah. my, uh, my criminal practice grew uh, basically just to deal with anything but firearms. And then I had a client one day, I'm also an NRA instructor, taught him basic pistol. He got his concealed carry permit. He brandished his firearm, which probably saved his life. But he did it the wrong place, the wrong time in Fairfield, Ohio. And he got arrested and uh, and was treated like, like the criminal that he wasn't. So we had to go through, uh, when he called me on the phone on a Friday night, uh, he was sobbing. Mm -hmm. Couldn't understand him. But being a criminal defense attorney, I figured something was going on. I said, if you've been arrested, hand the phone to somebody. And then the sergeant got on the phone and uh, and told me he was accused of brandishing, but then a felonious assault because of that, which was an overcharge. And so at probably 22 years old with two small kids at home and a wife, I had knocked on her door and we went around for about four hours, all the friends, relatives and neighbors she had to get, to get $10,000 cash to bond him out because I knew he wouldn't be the same person come Monday morning. Right. Yeah. And that's how uh, really something called defense started. I said, there's got to be a better way to do this. There has to be protection out there for the good person with a firearm. And at that point in time, there really wasn't anything when we started developing it. And then we launched uh, with the United States Concealed Carry Association at about the same time. Yeah. And uh, we, it's been full speed ahead ever since then. So, I mean, we'll, we'll start at the top level just to, uh, and then we can maybe get into some situational things and maybe some of the misconceptions that come along with the, the legality of mm -hmm. being a, a gun owner and having to use it in self-defense. Um, but, you know, at, at the end of the day, Second Call Defense has these packages that people can, uh, you know, purchase like a coverage. But it's also there's support involved. There's there's legal coverage involved. Um, and it, it really fills the gaps, a lot of gaps that you didn't know were there, right. you know, for things like, you know, castle doctrine and overall self-defense, uh, as well as, you know, some people assuming like umbrella policies and homeowners insurance will, will help cover those things. And many of them don't. Um, so, so kind of what are some of the things people can see, as far as coverage from second call defense? Well, the, the first thing I always like to point out is the fact that people's homeowners liability policies just don't cover you. Mm. Uh, essentially, almost all of them have an exception for intentional acts. Mm. So if you intentionally do something, your, your, your insurance company, your liability policy isn't going to cover you. Well, make no mistake about it. When you shoot somebody in self-defense, it's an intentional act. If it's not, then you have some other problems we have to deal with. And so when I first discovered that, uh, we started to form the, the insurance type portion of it, but also under the laws of the United States, an insurance company cannot provide upfront coverage for somebody that's been charged with a criminal act. 
they don't want you to uh, to shoot your neighbor or to shoot your wife and get to and collect the insurance policy. So that, right. that's probably where that came from. So the first thing was that we had to come up with a program that was not considered insurance. So we started an educational program with it in our own private foundation that we fund. Yeah. Now, the foundation had to be backed by insurance in order for the foundation not to be insurance. And so essentially what happens is the second call defense foundation pays for everything up front. Uh, nothing is ever has to be paid back to us. And then upon acquittal, the foundation just reimburses or the foundation is reimbursed by the insurance company. That way we're not considered insurance and everything is taken care of. Yeah. And so it was um, we had to cross a lot of hurdles in the meantime to, to figure out how to properly do this. Right. And uh, we spent a lot of money in attorney's fees, making sure that we got it done right. And most of the people out when we started, I think all of them, they were all insurance based. And so they were all reimbursement. That meant that you had to dip in your own pocket, pay for everything up front. And then you got your money afterwards. Well, I always said, if we had the money to do that, there would be no need for second call defense. Right, right. So, I mean, so now that we know that these options are available and we're going to give a link to your website in this week's show notes uh, and in the video description so people could see what that coverage is like. And we're going to have a little special deal going on with it as well that we'll give you at the bottom of the episode. But, you know, what do you think are probably the, the biggest assumptions from gun owners? If they think, OK, I'm going to eventually have to use this in self-defense, whether it's, you know, home intrusion or, mm -hmm. you know, just out in public <laughs> anywhere that you would, you know, carry your uh, concealed weapon, you know, what do you think is the biggest misconception that, hey, I was defending my life, so I'm going to be innocent and I'm not going to have to go on trial right. or, hey, this is castle doctrine. Like, what, what is the biggest, do you think, uh, a hurdle for people to get over in I, their I mind? Think probably the biggest misconception is that the fact that we all have a right to self-defense, but the defense of self-defense is an affirmative defense. Essentially, we're admitting, yeah, we did it. But I had a reason to do that. And what people don't understand is they feel that there's a good person with a gun. Everything's going to be black and white and uh, it's going to be clear. But oftentimes it's not clear from a couple of different areas. You could be in the wrong part of the country that has an anti-gun bias and it doesn't really matter how good you acted or how properly you did things. You're going to be charged or you're going to be charged. Uh, because of misconceptions in the investigation, or you're going to be charged simply because that's why they do it. Or at least the prosecutor is going to send things to the uh, grand jury. And so you're waiting for a month or two. And then in some cases, you know, you're patted on the back and you walk away. But the problem is, under the law, in the state of Ohio and throughout the United States, the good person of the gun is considered the defendant. The person who kicked your front door in and you shot it in your foyer and saved your, you and your family's life is considered the victim. And that's where we start. They're the victim. You're the defendant. And you have to prove that you properly used the firearm of self-defense and reasonably did so. Yeah, I, I think that's huge. I mean, you, you would imagine that uh, you were the victim the mm -hmm. whole time through. But that in the eyes of the law, since something was fired or, you know, what we've been seeing, right. obviously, a lot of the news, uh, whether they're handling guns properly or not, is the brandishing, right. you know, of firearms. Arms. A few weeks ago, we had Dan Zimmerman from The Truth About Guns on, and we spent some time talking about the couple in St. Louis and everything that went on with that. And and again, you're talking about a jurisdiction where, you know, the prosecutor and folks who are up for election right. are not necessarily you know, uh, two way friendly. Uh, and so that's, you know, another, another notch in their belt and, and you can't, you can't necessarily mm -hmm. overcome somebody's mm -hmm. personal bias and agenda as, as sad as that is, you know, uh, when it comes to hearings ab about this. And I think what just happened in St. Louis is a perfect example of, of, of what I'm talking about and, and how things happen that way. Uh, I've had many occasions where people just don't, don't understand that even though they did everything they had a legal right to do, they're still the defendant and they still have to prove. So, you know, how do you prove uh, to a jury uh, to, or to a judge that you probably use the firearm in self-defense? Right. Uh, when can you use the firearm or lethal force in self-defense? Well, essentially, if you're in fear of death or immediate bodily injury or harm, so that's a subjective. You determine that. It's not what I think on mm -hmm. the sidelines. It's what you think. And then you use your firearm in self-defense. Okay. Now, how do we convince a judge and a jury that you did the proper thing? Right. Well, that's the ability, opportunity, and jeopardy. I always call it the administration of justice as an acronym. The ability, the person had the ability, they had a knife, they're 10 feet away from you, and 
you were in fear because of that. Then you had the opportunity, hey, I'm right here. All that person has to do is approach me and stab me and I'm done. And then the last thing is, is jeopardy. I'm in fear for my life. And when you show that you acted as a reasonable person and you can outline the ability, opportunity and jeopardy, then then finally uh, you've won. You know, and, and you have uh, some testimonials on your website uh, that, uh, you know, some of them are just folks just saying that they feel they have a better peace mm -hmm. of mind and, and uh, that, mm -hmm. that they're happy that that's a, a resource that they have available to them. But you do have a few that were like, you know, hey, like I was legit arrested. Right. You know, and, and I believe one, uh, one testimonial was, you know, because they had uh, a second call defense, uh, they were, you know, they were out of jail and right. a matter of hours and, and things were going down the pike to make sure that they and their family were protected. Right. And, and we've uh, handled in the seven or eight years have been in existence. We've had uh, a gentleman outside of uh, LA in, in a uh, suburb who obviously is the wrong place to own a gun in that part of California. Sure. He shot his neighbor and his neighbor had been attacking him and everything was on film. But because of where he was in California, he was charged with first degree murder. Yeah. And his bond was several million dollars. And every attorney I talked to in the LA area wanted a hundred thousand dollars upfront, non-refundable. And so we were able to stroke that check. And our member uh, was acquitted of, of everything but a few gun specifications, and those were a hung jury. And so all the, all the f crimes related to the firearm and use of force he was, he, force he was acquitted on, but then you, you can't have hollow point ammunition in that jurisdiction, or you couldn't use a semi-automatic gun, and they yeah, were yeah, they yeah. were hung on that. So you know we we took care of him, and uh, he's he's out today, a free man. Uh, we just recently had a, a woman from Illinois who had to brandish her firearm in Indiana across the line there. And being from Illinois, where you don't have a right to a, a bond, you go to the court mm -hmm. and there, there's no commercial bonding companies and they, they set your bond. And they also provide that if you're from Illinois and you've done something else and, and you've been bonded out, say in Indiana, and you go back home, they don't have a right to come and get you. Yeah. And so because of that, she was elderly in her 60s. Uh, diabetic, need medication, and she's in jail and her family's calling me. Yeah. So we immediately got bond for her. But in, able, in order for me to do that, I had to get an extra $20,000 and give that as collateral to the bond company because they knew that they couldn't go get her if, if she fled. Obviously, a 60-some-year-old woman isn't going to flee. Yeah, a certain and, uh, type of fleeing. So <laughs> <laughs> we, we were able to get her home with her family, and, uh, and everything was fine with that. I had a gentleman in Philadelphia, an older gentleman. Uh, I got a phone call on the emergency hotline that uh, uh, I just shot a kid is what he told me. Mm. Like, oh, my God, someone shot a kid. But he was 73 years old on his bicycle in Philadelphia, riding home from work. And he was knocked off his bicycle and being mugged. Well, these kids were in their 20s, early 20s. I, when you're 70 years old, everybody's a yeah, kid. Yeah. And so we were able to... Um, to help him out. And he didn't call 911 or didn't call anybody until he got home and he called me first, second call defense first. So I got on the phone and helped him make the 911 call and waited on the phone with him for 45 minutes before the police arrived. Yeah. And then, uh, had a conversation, heard what was going on, and I knew things weren't going to go well. They said, we want you to come down to the station and make a comment or, or, or make statements. And I said, is he under arrest? And, and they said, no, I said, you're not going anywhere until, you know, we get your local counsel. So I had a local attorney online and I gave him my cell phone number because I still thought that things weren't going to go well. And sure enough, at two o'clock in the morning, and this was in six o'clock in the afternoon, the incident happened at two o'clock in the morning, you know, they're in his house telling him, you know, you're, why didn't you come down to see us? You're going to jail. And so I got on, on the phone with the, with the officer on the scene and I said, hey, wait a minute. Is he charged with anything? No. Are you arresting him? No. I said, then you can't take him to jail. And he said, we are. He's going to go one way or the other. And I said, just so I'm clear, you're violating just about every constitutional right he has and you're taking him right now. Right. And he said, yeah. And then I called um, his local attorney. But before his local attorney even got there, someone with a calmer mind at the precinct in Philadelphia let him go and apologized. Yeah. So, but you just don't know. Yeah. And I mean, there's so many, there's so many variables that go into it. And with so many different laws spanning so many different states and in some areas, so many different counties. I mm -hmm. mean, you were talking about a suburb of LA, right. you know, uh, several weeks ago, we had uh, the folks from Pew Pew Tactical on and they're, they're based out of uh, LA County. And some of the things that they have to deal with, I mean, even like you were saying, things like 
semi-auto, uh, semi-auto weapons, uh, hollow point ammunition. You know, when we send guns out to them for review and mm-hmm. video, I mean, we, we got to send them out to them California compliant. Right. You know right. what I mean? It's a whole kind of a whole other ball of wax. Now, before we had you on the show, uh, Kurt Staubach, who's been on the show before, uh, here at Faxon was telling me about you and telling me about second call. And he showed me his membership card. Uh, and on the back, there's a bit of a screen. Script, mm-hmm. you know, that goes through, okay, after you've called 911, and it even says what to say when you call right. 911, but this, you know, this is what you need to do. This is what you need to say. I mean, just for the folks who are, who, who are listening and we'll, we'll show a picture of one of your cards too, but, um, you know, what are some things that people do need to keep in mind if they've found themselves in this situation where they've had to use their firearm, uh, in self-defense or brandish their firearm in self-defense and need to start making those calls? You know, what are some of the high level tips that, that you could give them? Well, the first thing they need to realize is that the moment they call 911, they're on tape and the criminal investigation against them has begun. Now, I'm not saying that the the 911 operator is out to get you, but he or she will testify against you in court. Perfect example of that is in the Zimmerman case. George Zimmerman never made a 911 call, but five other people did who heard that, and they were grilled by both sides on the stand for what they said and heard on that 911 call. So it's important to know that as soon as you make that call, that uh, that the game is on, so to speak. Yeah. Then you want to make it as short as, as possible. You identify yourself. My name is Sean Maloney. I live at 4793 Willow Ridge Court. I was in fear for my life. There's been a shooting, sending animals and police. I'm six foot two. I'm bald. I'll be in my driveway yeah. with a white t-shirt and boxer shorts on. And <laughs> don't go out there with me. your gun. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Identify who, who you are and what's going on. And that's it. You've given them everything you, need, you needed to give them. You've summoned help. Now, at that point in time, it's time to protect yourself against the secondary thing. And that's, that's the, the criminal justice system and sometimes the criminal injustice system. We still have, we have the best system in the world, but at times it's certainly not colorblind and it's not, it's not blind to the the facts uh, real or what they imagine them to be. So that's simply uh, the first time I gave that seminar was at the great American outdoor show. And there was gaffes from everybody. I got surrounded by the media. You're telling people what to say. And I won't call you're telling them to be deceitful. I said, no, I'm not at all. I'm just telling them that they don't need to make any other statements until they're represented by counsel. Right. Uh, there was a Supreme Court justice 100 years ago, and he, he used some famous words. Any attorney worth his salt will advise his client to shut up mm-hmm. and not to say anything until his, his counsel is there. And that's what you have to remember. Now, on top of everything else that's going on, after you use your firearm for self-defense, you're suffering from the, uh, the psychological and physical aspects oh, of a certain sure. encounter. Yeah. Norepinephrine is just dumped in your body. Your, your heart rate's increased. You've had tunnel vision, hearing deprivation, uh, the adrenaline. You really don't know what happened. But that's the moment the police want you to get, make a statement. Well, that's the statement. That, at that point in time, that you were the most uh, a non-credible person that there is because you have no idea what happened. Right. And over time, that'll come back. Sometimes it's weeks, days, months, sometimes not all that ever comes back. That's just the way the body uh, uh, responds. And so that's why you say nothing and then we'll move forward. Right. And uh, I think that's huge because when I, I remember taking my first uh, concealed carry course and I remember uh, the instructor that I had, you know, talking about, OK, if, if you do have to use this, you know, and talking about the tunnel vision, talking about the memory and everything. But the thing that was crazy to me and I had never really thought about it, but it made sense. He goes, you're probably going to feel sick. Mm-hmm. Like you might vomit right mm-hmm. then and there. Like you there's going to be so much, like you said, the hormonal things, the adrenaline things that are happening to you. And at the end of the day, you're still trying to be a model citizen, right. call the ambulance, you know, mm-hmm. call 911, get everything on the up and up. And and it is, it's sad that uh, for the folks who, who did these things in a, in a, a lawful manner, do it in self-defense can get strung up by their own words simply because you're just trying to help. You're trying right. to be compliant. You're trying to, you know, respect the authority of the officer on the scene. But if you are in that state, 
there's a good chance you might say things you don't mean, say things right. that did happen or didn't happen, exactly. uh, and and gets gets yourself into more trouble because now it's no longer, hey, tell me the truth. Right. It's now we have to. I took what you first said as the truth, and now mm-hmm. we have to go back and debunk what you first said. Well, and, and that's the problem because you have two statements given immediately after the incident, and a statement given four days later are going to be markedly different. And then right. how, how do you how do you justify those to a, a jury of your peers or to the investigators? Oftentimes it's hard. Luckily, since concealed carry has become more of a common uh, thing in the United States, things are a little bit different. A little bit different. Uh, prosecutors are a little bit more educated. I was a consultant probably 10 years ago in uh, in Pennsylvania, rural Pennsylvania, first shooting that occurred. I actually got a phone call from Dick Heller from Heller versus Washington, D.C. and said, hey, I got a guy that called me. I think he needs your help. He was already represented by counsel in, in, uh, initially, but he was represented by his brother's divorce attorney, which was the wrong attorney to have. Mm-hmm. And kind of that's what got him down the wrong path. But he and his wife came home from dinner. They were entering their house. Uh, they were assaulted from behind. And uh, there's a struggle. Uh, Big Montana was his name. It was his cowboy action shooting handle. So I always refer to him as Big Montana. (laughs) Just had open heart surgery and was knocked to the ground. Yeah. Uh, Drew his his, uh, 1911 from his belt. And the first thing he did was a mistake. And that was fire a warning shot into the ground. And uh, on cross-examination at at one of the hearings, uh, I asked him, uh, asked the the true defendant, did you, what did you do when you heard a warning shot? He goes, I didn't hear a warning shot. In fact, Big Montana got to his firearm and fired a second shot, shattered his femur. I asked the guy, what did you think when when the bullet struck your femur? He said, I didn't feel anything. Because the adrenaline, the norepinephrine, the bad guy's feeling everything that you are. The police officer is. And in this case, Big Montana goes back to his truck, calls 911, hands the phone to his wife, and the 911 operator is telling his wife how to put a tourniquet on, how to apply direct pressure to stop the bleeding. Big Montana is putting the fire in his truck, but then he starts screaming, you SOB, I should have shot you again. You're bleeding like a stuck pig. I hope you bleed to death. He's making all these statements. He's screaming, but because of the psychological aspects of the threat encounter, he has no idea what he's saying or doing. Well, and he just said he just had open heart surgery. Right, exactly. And he <laughs> thought, and yeah. he's on blood thinners. Yeah. So he thinks this guy's beating me and I'm going to die. Well, The police got there. They investigated it. Everything was perfect. They said, hey, you had a right to do everything you needed to do. Two or three days later, the 911 operator gave the tape to the prosecutor because she said, listen to that stuff in the background. So then the prosecutor, who's never really in rural Pennsylvania, even prosecuted a murder case or anything, said, boy, something doesn't seem strange. He must have knew this guy. He's yelling, I should have shot you again. You're bleeding like a stuck pig. And because of that, then they charged Big Montana. Mm. Uh, And then... Because he didn't have proper counsel, I, I think from the beginning, uh, things went uh, bad for him. Uh, his, he and his wife ended up staying uh, with their son. Their house was foreclosed on because who wants to hire somebody that's just been charged with attempted murder? Yeah. And so then everything went down the road. But then once proper counsel was involved and we educated the prosecutor about the psychological aspects of our threatening encounter, he understood. Now, in, in, at trial, if you say too much, I have to bring in a, a forensic psychologist, have them recreate the situation, educate the jury as the, the uh, psychological and physical aspects of a threatening encounter. That's why I always say don't say anything because then we'll avoid that step. Yeah. I mean, again, it's 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 not uh, it's not an old Western movie. Right. You know, uh, this guy tried to steal my horse. They shot him dead. Judge says understood. Right. You know, it's it's not it's not that cut and dry, even if you are in the right. And I mean, I'm sure there's lots of folks who who feel themselves as, as being incredibly mentally strong. Mm-hmm. But you you can't overcome the fact that like if you just had to shoot someone or you you, you were just attacked or your loved one was just right. attacked. Like that is just so many variables, such a high stress situation uh, that frankly. Frankly, I don't think it's it's um, psychologically responsible to think that you're going to be of sound mind, you know, right after something you know what? like that. And, and, and nobody knows how they're going to react. Uh, the soldiers in the battlefield sure. uh, oftentimes go through the same things. Our police officers, our heroes on the front lines that are trained and that probably are, are put in harm's way more often than not. You don't know how they're going to react. And sometimes they don't react. I mean, I've, I've, I've had cases where uh, representative police officers, how many times do you shoot? Well, twice, twice. 
Well, he shot empty two magazines, but he didn't doesn't remember. And that's how we are. We really don't remember almost anything of what happened other than the fact that we were in fear of death or serious bodily injury. Yeah. And, and we reacted. We don't remember what we did. We don't remember the timing. Uh, there's there's so much that that we don't know. And we're in our own house. And suddenly, how do you react when your house is now treated like a crime scene? Oh, for sure. So, yeah. Because then it starts all over. When it, when the police arrive at your house, there's the bad guy. There's the weapon. Uh, my wife, my children witnessed it. And until we've had the opportunity to speak to an attorney, none of us are going to make any statements. And I'm sure you'll understand. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I do believe on uh, at, at least a couple of, of your options uh, for second call defense, there is some psychological help mm-hmm. too, right? Uh, some counsel right. that, that could could help folks kind of deal with the aftermath and trauma of a, of a situation yes, like this. The, the upper two levels have that. And uh, it's just not only... Uh, used for a situation when you've had to use lethal force. I had a uh, a person in Colorado who was cleaning their firearm, had a negligent discharge, mm. went through the wall. Uh, so we we represented her because she was charged criminally uh, f- for the negligent discharge, but she wasn't a firearms instructor. And she was so uh, disturbed by what happened. She couldn't instruct anymore. She couldn't sleep at night. So we, we even had to get her psychological counseling for that because what was going through her mind was what if, and sure. she could put those what ifs to sleep. Yeah. So. Yeah. Very good. Well, where could people find out more about you and about second call? Go to www.secondcalldefense.org and there's plans and pricing. There's a lot of free material on there, how to handle the 911 calls on there. We have a probably a 50 or 60 page guide on uh, on using firearms and self-defense and what to do afterwards. We have lots of links to other places. Uh, we, we, we're a big educational website on top of uh, uh, providing you the protection that you need through our, our membership benefits. Yeah, absolutely. And they do, like you mentioned, have some free downloadable guides as well as stuff that you could just read on the website uh, and uh, a great newsletter that uh, you can uh, keep up to date on some of the right. legal ebbs and flows and how things are changing across the country as, as far as uh, gun laws and uh, uh, the rights you have as, a, as an armed citizen. And you said you have a special offer yeah. code for our if, listeners. If anybody wants to uh, become a member of Second Call Defense, use the offer cord, code FAXON and we'll provide the first month's free. Now, I can't buy insurance for you. So what has to happen is you have to enter your credit card information. But in about two days, you're going to get your membership packet. And in that membership packet, you're going to have a check for your first month for free. That's fantastic. That way you can cancel if you don't like us, but you'll get, be able to get into the member section also and see the even greater things we have in there. Uh, there's seminars all over that I do. In fact, I, I mentioned uh, off camera that I'm heading to Colorado next mm-hmm. week for seminars on lethal force and the law. And uh, I'll try to talk to these guys and uh, let me do a seminar online for you. All right. That sounds great. Again, make sure you visit secondcalldefense.org. Use the offer code Faxon uh, to get your first month uh, free reimbursed back to you and, uh, and check out all of their great resources. Sean, thank you so much for being on with us. I appreciate it. Thank you. You know, it's no secret that the things that you keep in your gun safe are important. They're valuable. They're things that you want, you need, you need to hold on to, whether it's just your firearms and supplies, or I know a lot of people like to use their gun safes to hold things like tax returns and other important documents, family photos. All of those things are incredibly important. And to help keep better track of it and better maintenance on those items, Lockdown has a series of devices and utilities and tools to help keep those things things that you treasure safe. One of my personal favorites that we actually use here in the office quite a bit uh, around our storage for cameras and lighting and things like that is just one of their dehumidifiers. Now they have lots of other stuff. You may have already heard of the golden rod. You've heard a lot of stuff about the lockdown puck, uh, which is a smart device to help keep your gun drawer, your safe, your tools, even your wine cellar safe. Uh, and checking up on the humidity and the atmosphere in those places as well. We did a great episode with Lockdown several weeks back that you could check out at factsandfirearms.com slash blog, where we go through pretty much their entire product line and everything from the Lockdown Puck to dehumidifiers to even things like, you know, storage, 
rack shelving, things of that variety, keeping your safe, keeping your gun room clean, organized, and protected. And you could even get something like this, one of their room or gun safe dehumidifiers. If you're looking to organize that space in your home, again, whether it's for your gun safe or just anything that you hold valuable, we'd recommend you go to lockdown.com. Thanks for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode. Don't forget that if you have any ideas, whether it's a question or a topic idea or someone you would like to see on the podcast, please feel free to email us at podcast at factsandfirearms.com. We will do our best to get those questions, comments, and guests on the air. You could also find us on all of your favorite podcasting platforms. So Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, and obviously YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook Watch. So make sure you subscribe there. And don't forget that Sean Maloney of Second Call Defense has offered a free month of coverage from Second Call for all of our podcast watchers and listeners. Simply go to their website and use promo code FAXON to get your first month of coverage free. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. With our upcoming move and expansion to our new Westchester facility, Faxon Firearms is looking to grow our Cincinnati, Ohio-based team. At present, we are looking for professionals in shipping and receiving, quality inspection, CNC lathe, and CNC milling. If you are interested in joining the team for one of these or other positions, you can find current openings posted on LinkedIn, Indeed, and Facebook Jobs. You can also email your resume and cover letter to jobs at faxonfire.com firearms.com. Join us in our legacy of quality, innovation, and service at Faxon Firearms.